This is a story of musical time travel, of old stories told new, and the clear channel of artistic expression which can sometimes open up when critics and expectations are removed from mind. A rare private document recorded at home on reel-to-reel -reel tape late at night and stowed in an attic box for 30 years resurfacing to become an overnight sensation. Bearing a sheen of long-forgotten yesterdays with songs as fresh as if they could have been made tomorrow. I'm here today to share with you some things that I find incredibly fascinating about Sibylla Byers songwriting. We'll analyze two songs from her album Color Green and attempt to draw parallels between 20th century avant-garde structural concepts as well as explore some fresh harmonic tricks along the way. As someone who studied music composition at university level, I've witnessed a certain point in the learning curve where one is looking too closely at the fine details of their work to tell what they're even doing and fails to see the forest for the trees. We invent all kinds of new solutions to set ourselves free from the restraints we've created. Solutions which operate from within those restraints. Then we hear something like Sibylla Bayer and we immediately start reverse engineering as if all we needed was more analysis to get us back to the heart of it. It's all very backwards in effect, but here we are. It's a little too late for me to be saved. Oh academia, the lengths you will go to be human again. Who is Sibylla Bayer? Sibylla Bayer is a German-American actor and musician who is most well known for her album Color Green, which was recorded at her home in Germany from 1970 to 1973. Life got full and Sibylla chose to focus on bringing up her family in exchange of furthering her acting or music career. While often drawing comparisons to Leonard Cohen, Nico, Nick Drake, or Joni Mitchell, Sibylla Byers' songwriting had its very own idiosyncrasies and personality that weighed heavily on its impact. 1970 to 1973. Just to get some context, Nico released Desert Shore in 1970. Leonard Cohen released Songs of Love and Hate in 1971. Joni's output during this time included Blue in 71 and For the Roses in 72. Nick Drake put out Brighter Later in 71 and Pink Moon in 72 and was in the last years of his life as he would pass in 1974. Now I'm not trying to prolong these comparisons because they're pretty surface level in my opinion. Just like there's only one Nick Drake, there's only one Sibylla Byer. I just wanted to point out how much of a contemporary she was to some of these more well-known artists who were conceiving their own masterpieces at the time. The difference is that no one really heard her music until 2006. Well, no one outside the family, at least. After that short burst of creativity in the 70s, the tapes were boxed up and more or less forgotten. In the early 2000s, Sibylla's son Robbie was digging through family stuff in the attic and found the tape reels. He put them on and was enchanted by his mother's old songs, describing them as timeless and unusual. Robbie Byer, being a professional music producer himself, went into the studio, mixed it a bit, and burned a bunch of CDs with the plan to hand these to family members at Sibylla's upcoming 60th birthday party. Sibylla was in the dark about all of this, of course, and towards the end of the party, to her utter dismay, what should suddenly be playing through the speakers but the songs she recorded in private 30 years ago. Sibylla recalls in a recent interview, she felt embarrassed, livid, angry, and was very uncomfortable. She eventually calmed down and was able to accept that people were loving her songs. Enter Jay Maskus of Dinosaur Jr., who was either at Sibylla's 60th party or obtained a copy from Robbie somewhere along the way. Jay was mesmerized by the CD, and when Andrew Riger, the co-owner of Orange Twin Records, was on tour with his band and staying with Jay, he woke up hearing this music while Jay was preparing them coffee. In 2006, Orange Twin gave it a proper release, music fans ate it up, and the rest is history. This is all very interesting, but I didn't really know the whole story when I listened to this album. I found the music strangely compelling and was drawn into learning more. I will state that it stands on its own without the backstory. However, it's healthy to reiterate what a miracle it is that we get to hear Color Green at all, and how easily it could have gone the other way. I and many other devout others are so so grateful to Robbie for unearthing these recordings and believing that others needed to hear them too. I was actually lucky enough to exchange a few texts with Robbie when I was asking for permission to use Sibylla's recording in this video. He was very kind and gave me the go-ahead. Thanks again, Robbie. Color Green. The music that makes up the album Color Green is intimate in more ways than the obvious fact that she is singing these songs alone at home, late at night, with lyrics detailing family life, travel, friends, and the reflections of a young person finding their way. 
It's also intimate in its composition. The way Sibylla feels time, for instance, is idiosyncratic and uneven to most ears, but clearly intuitive to her, and lets you into a personal world of metric perception. This is a subtle fact that I believe pulls you deeper into the personality of each song. The pieces on color green adhere to their own system of logic. In order to enter the gates and fully embrace the hazy hidden fortress it has lain, you must let go of the rules and expectations you carry with you. Or like me, have them stripped away when the first song, Tonight, comes on. Some songs just sound inevitable. They go more or less the way you thought they were going to go, and there can be something very satisfying in that. This one feels more like a jigsaw puzzle. It fits together in an angular way to form a larger image. And while the uneven phrase lengths and varied refrains are jarring, I can't imagine it existing any other way. It's so far beyond repair. Sections are chopped and sewn together in different lengths like some sort of avant-garde quilt. It feels like a miracle that the thing doesn't come apart at the seams at any moment. Pulling off a miracle in a 2 minutes 26 second song with only guitar and voice is not something you come across every day. Just to be clear, I'm about to draw a direct comparison between the concept of modular composition or use of mobiles in 20th century classical music and elements of Sibylla Byers' songwriting. So hold on tight. An excerpt from the book The New Music by Reginald Smith Brindle, 1975. Some forms of architecture are based on prefabricated modules. Only a few different types of basic elements are required to complete a structure which though admittedly of a primarily functional nature, has aesthetic value. Similarly, some composers provide only a few basic elements indeed which, when differently massed together, form entirely different sound structures. Much like modular composition, the song Tonight consists of a few basic modules that get combined and rearranged into a structure that, as alluded to earlier, feels almost haphazard, yet balanced perfectly. Like some of Eric Satie's work, it also gives me the distinct feeling that this piece could potentially go on forever in different iterations. I once attempted to make a flowchart for this Nocian number 5 that would lay out the possible tracks one could take and prove that this version was only one of infinite others waiting to be birthed. I mostly ended up confusing myself. I still think there's something there that I couldn't properly articulate at the time, but that's another video. And we can't know if Sibylla played the song tonight on, say, a Wednesday, if the form would have been slightly or totally different than on a Sunday. All we have is the evidence of this single recording. These types of modular scores gave me inspiration for a fun way to demonstrate what I wanted to get across about this song. Instead of writing a linear score, I cut out all the individual sections so that they could be moved around and reordered in time with the music. Let's go over each of the parts. Orange is the Tonight fragment, a descending melodic fourth from F to C, and the chords D flat to F minor for two beats. At some point, this second beat will get sliced off. And we have these other variations for hurt. In my mind, there he exists in the orange as well for the fact of sharing the descending fourth, even though the second chord is different. This one also gets varied later on. And we have these last two, tonight's, for variance at the ending. Purple is the When I Came Home From Work fragment. This second beat of F minor also gets sliced off at one point. In the second variation, the melody turns up at the end, where you'll see a shade of pink. There's a consistent rule about this one that turns up at the end. It always functions as the doorway to the verse. Let's walk back so we can piece some of this together. P 
pink is the verse. Again, there are slight variations on where it ends. Here it ends on the B-flat minor, but it is resolved by the A-flat chord at another point. helps transition into the bridge in green. In green, the bridge consists of this stepwise descending line from F and again some chordal variations. It is a bar longer in the second variation. Now that you have the modules we'll be working with, I think we're prepared to go into the demonstration of how these intertwine. I decided it was important that we hear the words in order to more clearly comprehend these feats of song structure, so I went with playing Sibila's original recording under my demonstration. And I'm really glad that I did. I feel like I was able to more accurately convey what goes to my head when I hear it myself. Tonight, when I came home work hurt tonight when I came home from work there he unforeseen sat in my kitchen fathering himself for bread and the cat was on his knee and smiled at me tonight when I came home from work Tonight When I came home from work There he Unforeseen Passed the guitar and said I battered my car right now Won't you please give me your tune We had a change of the moon we had a change of the moon Tonight, when I came home from work Tonight, when I came home from work Tonight, when I came home from work There he, unforeseen Changed in a knees, a chair and said, what's that sorrow you bear? And I could tell him he understood He gently took my arm He listened to my tears till dawn I dedicate this song to you Tonight we had change of the moon change of the moon tonight when I came home from work tonight when I came home from work tonight tonight I know what you nerds are thinking when you hear those chords. Addie's going to talk about key pairing of the parallel minor and major again, because modal interchange is his favorite thing and there's nothing he likes better. Well, yes, but there's even more wacky stuff than that going on in Softly. Lots of untethered why not moments, which give this record its distinct sense of play that is so charming to me, and the results are brilliant. Over a light, bouncy, slightly bluesy beat, the verse progression consists of the four chords C, E flat, F minor 7, and B flat. If we take out the C major, these three chords fit neatly into the key of E flat as the 1, 2, and 5 chords. There's a duality at play in the centering of this progression in that the majority of the chords lean towards E flat. However, C major being the first chord gives it an obvious prominence as some kind of home. A home we never stay at very long. 
Like when you have housemates in your 20s and you're always at um, Starbucks. A little side note, this type of pairing of a 2-5 from E flat with a 1 from C is often referred to as the backdoor cadence. Like when you're in your 20s and you've come back from a late night at um, Starbucks and sneak into the back door because your housemates who are also in their 20s would definitely be asleep at 10 p.m. when the Starbucks on your street closes. And going into the back door definitely wouldn't wake them. More likely the front door is just broken because your landlord never fixes anything even though you're paying way too much for that crappy closet you live in that doesn't even have working AC and you have to pay for internet too and there's this weird... The melody is pretty chromatic throughout and slightly bizarre, choosing to emphasize tones that don't hold their ground for long. Just that softly motive alone is wow. Moving from E, the third of C major, to E flat, the root of E flat. E flat, the seventh of F minor, and then B flat, the root of B flat. The B section, or pre chorus, uses this walk up on C major, from the fifth to the sixth, then major seventh. I call it the Harvest Moon line. It's also in Swinging Party by The Replacements, even though this song is older than both of those, and I know it goes back way earlier than that. But this motive further reinforces the C major tonal pole for a time, then straight back to E flat like nothing happened. Note this pattern. A major chord doing the 5, 6, major 7 walk up, then a major chord a minor third higher. The second time it ends on D instead, and we settle here, repeating the Harvest Moon walk up, then landing on F major, that major chord a minor third higher, which brings us back home to C major in the form of a plagal cadence, Amen. That's a 4 to 1 in C major, F to C. Now we're at the chorus. In the chorus, we commit to C major a little longer, rocking between a C sus, and the fourth time, minor. So fun, I love it. Then more chords from E flat. Here, I'll stop talking for the second round. forget that there's a bridge in this song. Maybe it's the way it's wedged into the cracks of the last chorus with a simple maneuver, where instead of simply knocking on the door of A flat, as per usual in the chorus, she goes inside. The chord progression here is a basic 1, 5, 4, 1 in A flat major. That being A flat, E flat, D flat, and back to A flat. And the timing of it is really surprising too. Let's hear it again. There's something so earthy in these recordings that I believe encompasses what we most seek in artistic expressions, but often can't pin down. When the act of living becomes one with that of creating and bypasses the awareness of doing such, there's a spiritual catharsis, a message that hits right to the core, no translation necessary. Life gets strange. We may do something out of the ordinary that helps us work through the changes inside and around us, with no expectation that it's leading anywhere. 
Life gets full. We may shift our focus to maintain the worlds we've created and maybe won't pick up that guitar as often as we used to. But it's nothing to lament. The transience is what makes these little gems of life special. Thanks everyone for watching. As always, I love to hear all your thoughts on all this, so please leave a comment if you want. Bye!